Uh, thanks for the invitation. So, um, okay, so I'm going to today, you know, let me start how to do this. Like, okay, sorry about this. So, have to go. All right, so let me start with motivating example here. So this is just a very simple illustration, just to give you an overall picture of the talk, although I know that at least Dan does this kind of thing. So this is not a very new uh, idea for him. So you have like, let's say you have a part of the dynamics that is unknown. So in this case, basically, I just pick a simple uh, molecular, canonical molecular dynamics here as an illustration. It doesn't have to be this. So here, basically, the unknown part is this whole pieces here on the that I highlighted with red, right? So the task here, this is the, the main task that I want to do is that basically, if you're given discrete time series of the observe variable, which is the X or the resolve variable, if you wish to call it that way, I'll start to calling it observable. Then you want to predict the evolutions of this X, this variable X, given some initial condition that might not necessarily be on the training data. So the initial condition could be new, okay? Now, this particular subject, okay, has many names in different literature. Some people call it closure problem, some subgrid parametrization, also somewhat related to the so-called reduced order modeling. Uh, and if the problem has some structure, let's say there is separation of time or spatial scale between X and Y, then you know, usually this problem can be also formulated in, as an averaging and homogenization theory. And then one take asymptotic expansion to close it. But in this case, I am insisting to call this is a missing dynamical system rather than reduced order dynamic modeling because to me, reduced order means you know the underlying model to be reduced. So in this case, I would emphasize like by missing, I really completely don't know what is why. And we actually hope to use the machine learning method and data to uh, emulate this unknown uh, dynamical uh, components. Okay. So just to basically quote a uh, statistician, you know, uh, George Box, basically we say that all model, he said all model is wrong, but some are useful. So effectively I agree with this. So in, in a very big uh, picture is like, here's the first big principle model that you can derive from uh, conservation laws, for instance, not necessarily have to be this lens of very simple dynamics. And then the part that unknown that you want to parameterize, you wish to actually emulate this with data-driven modeling and using machine learning tools to close this, okay? So just to give you, you know, a um, kind of notion, what am I after in here? Basically, on this talk, right, the first pieces is like, I will formulate this problem as a supervised learning task. What is the task here is basically to estimate the dynamical equation of the unresolved dynamics, okay? So here, I'm just giving you a sort of a picture of example of realizations of those equations, simple equation with double well potential. So you can see here, the green curve here is basically the trajectory. It's going up and down. So this is starting from initial conditions that are not in the training data. And then here I compare it with a particular uh, 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 estimator that, you know, I will, not discuss it very, very detailed. This is just a linear kernel method, how to reconstruct the dynamics of the, of the fast variables. And you can see, you know, the estimator can somehow, looking from this inlet, right? It, it produce, you know, or track the trajectory up to some finite time and then it start to diverge, for instance, right? So the, the questions that, that, that I would like to understand is that at least one is like, uh, is there any convergence guarantee? Like how, how, how long of lead time of prediction can, can, we, can we, you know, basically expect, you know, using certain uh, machine learning method and so on. And then later on, I'll, if time permits, I'll also discuss uh, convergence in terms of invariant statistics, okay? So this is just sort of give you a motivation or, or what, what is this talk is about. So here I will outline the talks. I'll split it into three parts. So part one, basically part one is about, uh, I'm going to give you vocabularies in a sense, okay? So in a sense, I'm going to draw some connections between several tools that has been 
propose uh, to study reduced order modeling or you know evolution of observables for, for instance Morris Wansik for Malson and then what I wish to do is to connect this with this Tuckens delay embedding theory and finally to rewrite them as a statistical regression problem and then once you reformulate this what I hope is that you can use any machine learning algorithm in your disposal at your disposal to solve, to empirically solve this statistical regression problem. And then I'll go back to the closure formulations once we understand this vocabulary and I'll discuss convergence and I'll give you one numerical example. We have many and uh, in, in, on, on the papers. And then if time permits, this is the last pieces, which is paper that we are sprinting to close this very quickly is basically to answer the following question. Usually, you know, when you, uh, generate a closure model, you, you construct closure model, then you hope that the invariant statistics is also recaptured. Let's say you want to reproduce the autocorrelation function, you want to reproduce invariant density statistics, right? Or invariant statistics. Then the question is like, if the underlying dynamics have those invariant statistics, okay, then under which mathematical conditions can we achieve you know, can we, can we, can we, can, can the approximate model from machine learning reconstruct or re-estimate this invariant statistics? And if so, then what's the error bound? Because the error bound will be, you know, will, will, will be very useful for you to, to, to say like, you know, to, to understand how many training data points that are needed. What is the hypothesis space you need to construct, you know, in order to, to, to have a guaranteed convergence of invariant statistical estimation? Okay, so we'll see how the time goes. Okay, all right, let me start. So the first part here, I'm just gonna start with basic, you know, uh, 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 notion of dynamical system. So I consider just a measure preserving ergodic dynamics given by this discrete map phi, you know, uh, acting on this uh, phase space omega. So it has invariant measures. Uh, in this case, right, what I'm interested in is actually the evolutions of an observable. So what's an observable? It's just a random variable. In this case, it's like a random variable. So X take omega to Rn. So in, 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 in this case, it defined as here's the realization of X. It's basically this function taking this omega. Ba basically, it can be defined as X uh, being, in, uh, being, uh, uh, basically x take this uh, phi iterate t types of omega zero. Okay, so this little xt is exactly that xt or the, the result variables in the previous slides, okay? So since I'm interested on the evolutions of just x or, or these observables, right? Then the standard notion to understand this in the dynamical system theory is the operator theoretic called Koopman operator. So Koopman operator, basically it's a linear operator that acts on these observables is defined as F composed with phi iterate T times. So in this case, right, it is a, I, I should emphasize, this is a linear operator despite that the, non the dynamics is nonlinear, okay? So given this no notion, then one can actually rewrite this observable XT or this realization as just a Koopman operator iterate T times on the observable at omega zero, at time zero. Basically, it's just a notation. Now, I would like to uh, describe a reduction model, okay? Model reduction. I would like to rewrite this in terms of uh, evolutions of X, right? So in the sense, I need the projection. So I, I need to define projection operator. So I uh, define P as the projection operator. Later, I'll call Q is just the, identity minus P, so this is pro projection to the range space V. What is the range space here? It's just a space of function that you can write as a function of X, basically. Now, given all of these notations, we can rewrite the discrete maurice wansik formula using the Dyson's formula. So the formula is basically a representation of this Koopman map, okay? This is the discrete version. I think most people are familiar with the uh, with the continuous version with the integral form, but this is just about the same, okay? So here it acts on this observable X. You can write it simply after using all the definition, you can write it as a, here's the contribution of Markovian term, non-Markovian and orthogonal. So Q again is identity minus P. 
orthogonal in the sense that it is orthogonal to the subspace V here, okay? So in this uh, 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 literature, okay, here are a couple of things that are important to say is like this representation is not unique, okay? Because it depends on how you choose your projection operator P. So for instance, right? Common choice, at least I took it from the paper Chorin et al here, is using conditional expectations, or here's a sometimes called Mori projection, it's just rank one projection operator here. Now, depending on the choice of P, this expression on Markovian, non-Markovian could be very complicated. For instance, if you choose conditional expectation. But then if you choose this Mori type projection, uh, this Markovian and non-Markovian term becomes super trivial, but then the orthogonal error is super large. So then it's really hard to represent, okay? So you just pick your poison, what you want to do with this. And there are a lot of people doing, you know, uh, working on this, choosing appropriate P, and then approximate these guys with parametric model, with, let's say, rational functions, with Fourier expansion, and, you know, maybe... Taylor expansion and so on and so forth. So what I will do, instead of using this type of projections, so I will basically motivate the projection based on the Takens delay embedding theory. The reason why I wanna do that, uh, although you'll see it's basically just a change of vocabulary, it allows me to give a connection to machine learning or to specifically supervised learning method, okay? So here you go. So I'm going to choose, uh, motivate my choice of P. So what's, what's my choice of P? Uh, in this uh, theory of delay embedding, okay, basically if you define a delay coordinate map, so this is just a map. It takes your face space and you basically, you know, look at basically it map your face space into uh, snapshots of observables at the, you know, uh, uh, his, historical time, time now, minus one and so on. Okay, so now the delay embedding theory here, it says the following, under some mild assumptions on X, okay, and the flow map, then this delay map, uh, delay coordinate maps, you know, if we set M to be large enough, then this map is homeomorphism between the support of the invariant measure M and the invariant measure mu, and this uh, space. So basically what, what this means really is that the Borel Sigma algebra of this support uh, set of mu is identical to Sigma algebra generated by this delay coordinate map. What does that mean is that if you take any conditional expectations of any random variable here, given this delay coordinate map, then it's equal to identity. So meaning like there's nothing more random, no more secret here. You know everything pretty much once you see enough history. So it's like you're watching a movie, you, you watch enough history, then you can identify the, directly this is that movie. So you don't have any more randomness in this case. That's the analogy. So you can see that indeed this conditional expectation is a very, very simple uh, uh, operator. It's just an identity operator, right? at this point. But nevertheless, I'm going to choose this as my projection P, okay? Now, by choosing this, right, if I choose P to be this identity operator, you can see identity minus P is zero. So if I plug into my Maurice Wansik representation, then the memory term's gone, the orthogonal term's gone. You only have the so-called Markovian in this sense is in quotation, okay? So the Markovian term is that exactly. And I say it's in quotation because it, if it is effectively a non-Markovian function, right? it depends on the memory. So it makes this representation very, very simple. Now you can say, wait a minute, you're not doing anything here, right? Basically you're just, uh, this is a tuck and flow map, right? You're just rewriting with different vocabulary, right? You rewrite M0 with this conditional expectation. So what's the big deal about this, right? So the only important things here to take away is the following, right? By realizing this tuck and flow map as a, a, a conditional expectation, then we know from statistical theory, a conditional expectation 
is indeed you know, a response function of some minimization. Okay, so then you can think of M0. This is, you can obtain this as a minimization of the following L2 problem. So this is a supervised learning task, right? Of course, you know, but then basically the whole point is that, you know, you, you, you can so somewhat relate, you know, what you want to estimate with a supervised learning task. And then you can use any machine learning algorithm here to solve this, okay? So in the next uh, one, two slide, I'm going to show you uh, one example. So there are many ways how to empirically solve this uh, uh, L2 regression problem, but I'm just going to give you one example. So an example here, this is uh, at least, this is a consistent estimator. So what I did is I just apply a technique that initially we, when we designed this, we didn't think to use it for these things. But basically the idea is this, uh, you can think about looking at this integral operator, right? Let's say, okay, if you're not familiar with this, let's say if the kernel here, K, I just choose it, uh, I just replace it with Delta measure. So if I choose it with Delta measure, you see integral of Delta function of that with respect to the, you know, this is weighted in, in, in the density. So you will get effectively your, your, your function, right? So this is just standard, standard thing. But what we did is actually, instead of using Delta function, we use a Markov kernel that we constructed from an uh, algorithm that, you know, uh, that is uh, motivated by diffusion maps algorithm to approximate uh, Laplace Beltrami operator on the manifold. But those terms are sitting on the order epsilon, which is not important for this application. But the point is like order one is this. Or if you are a statistician, this is nothing more than uh, like a kernel density estimation, if you wish, right? That's what you do, right? You, you, you discretize this, you average over a kernel, and then you get the density, right? M0 is like density. You can think about it that way. So, but we can at least, you know, prove this uh, numerically. Okay, what is Q? Q is just a density uh, defined as the Radon Nicodim of the push forward of your measure with respect to the volume. So in this case, I'm assuming there's a manifold assumption on the data. We can prove that basically the discrete estimator of this, so you you discretize this, you get gonna get M, M0, okay? Up to order epsilon, order epsilon is this integral uh, uh, error. And then this is just a uh, error by of estimating the density because in reality, we never have the density of the data. So you have to estimate them first. And then the third term here, this is just an error induced by the discretizations. Okay, so you can kind of balance this. So then in practice, this is a very easy method, right? The method is just you first construct, you know, a discrete representation of this, right? And then whenever you want to evaluate it on a new value xi, that's for prediction, right? Then what you do is like you, you, you construct, you know, reconstruct this matrix because inside of this matrix, you have to evaluate your new function value, compare it with all of the training data, right? So this you have to construct, and then you just uh, multiply by factor multiplication. So it's just matrix factor multiplication at the end, that's the cost. So this is a very simple method. I mean, just one method. I'm not saying like, you know, you can kill this with anything with this. Uh, there is an issue here. D is dimension of the manifold. So this stuff, you know, suffer from curse of dimension of intrinsic manifold, not the ambient data, okay? So now we can try this method and this is, we call it the kernel smoothing on very simple examples, just to illustrate the idea here. So in this example, what I did was the following. You take five dimensional Lorentz 96 model. This is uh, chaotic dynamical systems. So what I'm showing you here is the following. What, what we want to do is the following. I'm only giving you one component of the of these five components. Uh, so your observable is just one component. And you want to use that data of one component to predict, you know, to, to construct this as an estimator of the trajectory. This is the conditional expectation of omega one at the future time, given the history. This is your, this is what we want to 
construct. So now what I'm showing you on the left here, this is a part, this is a, an example of a prediction. So this is a lead time prediction in starting from zero from an initial condition that is not in the training data. You can see it, the true trajectory is the black. Now, what I want to highlight here is like, if you increase the memory length, for instance, like M from four to 48, so M is the memory lag, right? Then you can start to see actually the trajectory is getting closer and closer to the truth, okay? And on the right-hand side, basically just statistics out of, this is just one, one uh, realization, this is statistics out of 10,000 out of sampling realizations. Just to show you like, you know, this actually, when, when you construct this estimator, you can, you can you know, this uh, approximation using this Takan's embedding is really, really giving you some prediction skill when M is large enough to predict the trajectory, okay? But what do we learn from this first part here? Basically is the following, right? The delay embedding, the choice of this projection operator in delay embedding, simplifies the Maurice one six, okay? To just approximating this token flow map, you can rewrite the token flow map as conditional expectation. As soon as you know how to write as a, as a conditional expectation, then this uh, token flow map can be realized by solving a, the corresponding L2 minimization supervised learning task, okay? Now, I'm going to, uh, before I move to part two, I'm just gonna mention there are lots of things, I mean, in this paper that we, other things that I didn't, I, I, I didn't, didn't, didn't talk about in this paper, okay? But, you know, for, for the purpose of the talk, I'm just going to go to the closure problem now, okay? So now this is the second part. Let me remind you what's in this closure problem. It's the following setup, right? You have a X, and here's I indicate the dynamical systems for F as just a map here. This is done. This is the known dynamics, and the, the Y is unknown. They are all fully coupled. Okay, the assumption is just this: satisfy ergodic discrete dynamical systems here. There are more assumptions for the convergence. I'll show you later. Okay, so what is the task here again? You want to reconstruct an approximate dynamics that can track X, the evolution of X. In some case, even the invariant statistical distributions, okay? So, you know, just to understand the construction that I'm going to develop here, I'm going to split it into two uh, sub cases here. Case one, imagine now if I'm giving you uh, the full time series, Xi and Yi. Of course, in reality, we'll be more interested on case two, where you're only given time series of Xi to learn this. So now uh, let me go on case one. So case one, right? So I'm going to draw on a particular uh, SDEs, just an SDEs example. We have on on uh, on on the we have also also on the deterministic system example, but in this case, this is just for the purpose of the uh, talk. Okay. So now here's here's the consider the full dynamics here. It's just a Euler Maruyama discretization of uh, like SDEs, okay? So the SDEs is, let's say, two dimension here even. So I highlight you the red, this is the part that is unknown, okay? So the drift and diffusion coefficients of the fast variable is unknown, okay? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to photocopy the strategy that I talked about in the previous section, meaning I'm going to rewrite this G as a conditional expectation. And then we're gonna learn that using a machine learning technique, okay? So, so now you can rewrite G in this case, right? It's very simple. It's just this, right? G is just conditional expectation of the uh, discretizations of the derivative, right? On, on, of Y given X and Y, right? Because at this point I'm assuming X and Y are known, right? So, you know, instead of writing, keep writing this elaborate notation, I'll just use this notation, okay? So I'm gonna just replace that. So I'm replacing this, okay? So just simple. Now, you know, this, I'm just re rewriting the dynamics, nothing, nothing else, right? Now, let's just uh, say this is the estimator for that. So there's just an epsilon related, just basically to label this is, you know, an estimator for that with some, 
uh, error scale characteristic with that will uh, scale with epsilon, which I will describe in a minute. Okay. So once you have this estimator, right, then you can actually use the residual. Basically, you just use the residual data to estimate the uh, diffusion coefficients, right? This is a standard, right? There's nothing really different than what anyone would do, right? Because I have the data of y, then I can do so, right? So, so now, you know, in this case, what can I say, okay? So this is my estimator, right? It's just about the same like the true model. The only difference is that my epsilon, I have an estimator on this. So this, there's an epsilon and I have a hat here. Just to make a distinction, this is the approximate model. This is everything with hat and the true model without hat. Okay, so now what theoretically what I can say is the following. If this is actually indeed a consistent estimator, and then it also has a variance error, L2 error of order epsilon square, okay? Then under mild condition that if F and G are Lipschitz continuous in X and Y, given same initial condition, you can prove the con uh, pathwise convergence up to finite time. And the error bound here is indeed polynomial in time. What is that? That means is like the following. This is quite good in the sense that if you expect your error to be accurate up to order one here, you want this time, you know, of course time is discrete time. So I have to multiply by Delta. Delta is the uh, time discretization, right? So this time, has to scale like epsilon to the minus a half, right? So this is kind of telling you, oh, you guarantee to predict up to this length, depending on your error, epsilon is characteristic of error of your machine learning, okay? So I'm going to show you in the next slide, go back to the same example again, right? So I will not uh, discuss the method, how we get this estimator very uh, uh, detailed, but it's basically a linear method called, known as kernel embedding. If you wish, you know, if you're more of a scientific computing, this is just like a scale uh, Fourier, uh, basically a scale Fourier decompositions or, or Fourier method basically to estimate that conditional expectation if you wish. Okay, later, if I have time, I can digest a bit more. But here, like what I'm showing you exactly is the same figure I showed you before, time trajectory as, you know, and you can see the green curve on both sides are, are, are basically the truth. It, from the inlet, you can kind of say, okay, whatever happened on the left, which I trained using 50,000 data point, and what is shorter, right? The prediction time is shorter than on the right, which I trained with 500,000 data. Okay, so now like, you, let's see, you know, what, what can we say from this error bound, right? Uh, so suppose if I, if I assume very generous assumption here, like my G that the object I'm trying to estimate is sub all F or H with a regularity beta. And then, you know, because this is just a linear estimator, the optimal uh, uh, minimax linear error rate that is very famous in statistics by, in, by Stone here, is saying basically epsilon has to go to, you know, to, to scale like order n to the minus beta over two beta plus d's dimension. So I'm being very generous, put the beta infinity, put d equal to one, right? Then we obtain this, right? T delta is epsilon minus a half from a previous derivation. You plug in this, you see what's on the left is the time is about, about 15. That's about what it is. Time on the right is super conservative here. It's like a quarter of whatever we get here. So this is, you know, sort of like very conservative estimate, like why we try to understand this at least, okay? Of course, you know, this is just a very simple illustration. Now, of course, once you have the, the dynamics, you can also run the dynamics and check uh, their invariant statistical properties like density. This is numerical check at this point autocorrelation functions, and then other kind of metric like mean exit time, reaction rate. I guess, I don't know, this is probably, I took all of this from Dan's old paper with Eric van Neiden perhaps, right? You compute this kind of stuff, right? So we just compare, you see like the true is this, if you use more data, you get quite close to this, right? So of course, this is a very, very simple dynamical system as an illustration, right? so that you can kind of understand where the framework is coming from at the moment. 
So on the third part of the talk, if I have time to digest into it, I will actually talk about the mathematical condition. When can this guy be achieved? This estimation of this, uh, at least the at least the invariant statistics, okay, or the density in weak sense. Now, I'm going to go to the case, to the real case where the only data that is given to you is x. Remember, like when I start this, I say your time series. I discuss x, y, y, i. Now you're only given training data x, i. So how to deal with this, right? Because this is more, more close to the applications. Given x, i and the dynamics f, so I will define a, a latent variable, I call it theta, as an identifiable unresolved variable. So basically the idea is that instead of you look at x as a function of x and y, you think of it as a function of x and theta, where theta could be function x and y. This sounds complicated now. I'll give you an example. Okay, here's an example. Suppose you know you're dealing with uh, truncation of uh, this is just uh, this is full dynamics. I write it uh, Galerkin Fourier truncation of nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Okay, suppose now the resolve variable is just the zero Fourier mode. Just so x is just the u zero. Okay, so the moment u zero, this cubic term is gone because k is zero. Now you look at the sum here, right? This sum, right? You can split the sum into component that depends on u zero and components that depends on other thing as well. So it, it can depend on u zero, it can depend on other Fourier modes. So in this particular example, this is what I call theta. So this is the theta. So basically in the big picture is the following, right? If I give you only data of u zero, you probably will not be, most likely, I think theoretically, I don't even see how to uh, infer or identify all of this higher Fourier wave number. But at least you can identify theta, right? You can, you know, just regress, right? You can approximate the derivative regress. You can identify training data for theta, okay? So this is why I call it identifiable about unresolved variables, okay? So now in this case, I'm going to rewrite my dynamical systems now. Instead of X and Y, remember the original is X and Y. Y is very high dimensional space. Now I'm going to rewrite it as a function of X and theta. Theta is the same size as X because it's a flux that enter to, to, to affect X, right? Because lo look at this theta, for instance, in this example, it's just same, this is scalar, right? So then my, my closure model will be a function of x and theta, okay? So now in order, you know, then, then I have this, I take a liberty here, I just do it directly. I say, okay, I need to put a Maurice Wansik on this because I need to write it as evolution of x and theta. And then I employ the token embedding, right? Then, you know, the thing that I need to estimate is just this guy, right? Which is the Markovian term of the, Maurice Swansick, right, that I derived in the previous, uh, in the part one of the talk. So it's very simple, right? So I just need to get this guy. This is my target function in, in a sense, right? This is what I want to estimate, okay? So in this case, you know, if my approximate model is that, so this guy is from a regression. Again, if you assume that your, your estimator is consistent and then it has a variance of order epsilon square, this guy is just residual, you know, uh, to compensate in case if your hypothesis space is not big enough to cover the underlying dynamics. Okay, so we just use Gaussian noise in this case. Then you can say, you know, if uh, PMU is uniformly bounded, that just mean basically G is uh, Lipschitz in, uh, as a function of X and theta. Then under the same initial condition, you can have pathwise convergence too. Of course, now the rate is bad. It's not. Uh, polynomial in T, now is exponential in T. Okay, so first of all, right, uh, the reason why this is the case, because I don't have any more structure on these dynamical systems. Second is that I suspect, I mean, okay, this A is greater than one. I suspect that, you know, if it's a chaotic dynamical system, this A may have something to do with Lyapunov exponent, but I don't know how to prove that. That's an open problem, okay? So effectively what this says is like, you know, if your learning method is consistent, you, you have a consistent, but you know, I don't have a good rate in this. This is a kind of vacuous rate, right? It's just a consistent as epsilon goes to zero, okay? 
So now, you know, I'm going to show you, I'm going to solve this minimization problem to get this using neural networks. Uh, the reason is because this is very high dimensional, right? So in this case, one of my collaborator from Pudu, Hai Chao Yang, he basically uh, uh, persuaded me to use this. Okay, I say, fine, you know, he has student to run this. So to me, it's just a minimization algorithm to, you know, uh, empirically estimate this conditional expectation. So this is just a uh, recurrent neural network type, you know, that, that, that has been introduced around. And I'm no expert to discuss any of this. It's just a method for me, okay? So we try this on kuramoto sivasinski equations. So in this case, right, uh, what am I going to do is the following. The true trajectory I constructed using 48 modes, 48 Fourier modes. Uh, by the way, uh, on the parameter that we choose, the first three Fourier modes are unstable or uh, linearly unstable. Like if you linearize, this is unstable. And then we only resolve the first six modes, okay? So here's my closure model, right? So here's the, the, the dynamical equation for the first six modes. This is the flux, the unresolved component, which is basically just this summation that is uh, beyond this uh, uh, indices, right? So those are the theta. And then I just learned the evolution of the theta here using this uh, recurrent neural network. Learn it as a function of memory of this Fourier, first Fourier mode six and uh, theta. Now, let me mention, this is a very high dimensional function to learn effectively, okay? So I, I wrote down this 480, you can count it basically Look, I have six Fourier modes complex, so that's 12. So 12 here, this is another 12, so there's 24. And then I have memory, M, I just put 20 memory lag, right? So that's 480 function to learn. So if I use any kind of linear method that we learned from the classical numerical analysis, nothing actually <laughs> will give you anything meaningful. So that's why we use this neural network, okay? Just to empirically emulate this uh, conditional expectation. So this is just a simple result. So here I show you the evolution of X as a function of time. This is the error. So you can see this is roughly zero until some time and start to deviate, right? And we compare it, you know, the closure model that we propose with bare truncated, but bare truncated means I completely ignore theta, just forget even it exists, okay? Here's more uh, detailed statistics. Here's through trajectory, time is going up or comparing Fourier modes, like first Fourier modes, cross correlations and so on. And, you know, uh, the first energy spectrum and so on. So we can kind of capture this. So we basically, in this part of the talk, we developed this closure modeling framework, okay? Uh, of course, one can use any, you know, uh, uh, estimators, okay? That doesn't have to be LSTM, okay? Now I should also mention beyond this Kuramoto Sivasinski that I show you, we tested many problems, truncated Burgers Hoff, even like Lorenz and so on in these two papers below. Uh, we also study connection uh, of to, to this kernel embedding, you know, uh, what, what am I writing here? Study the connection to the kernel embedding of, okay. So we just basically uh, study the connection of parametric and non-parametric through some RKHS theory and kind of, Basically, I, uh, the, the, main, the main point here is that to say, if you look at parametric modeling that we usually do, what I mean by parametric is that you impose certain dynamical equations, then that can be viewed as a special case of non-parametric uh, um, uh, modeling paradigm in a sense. So that's actually in this paper, 2020. Okay, so, okay, I have 42 minutes here, I've done. So I didn't even start the third part. Do you want me to stop or to continue? I think you can continue. Okay. Uh, as as I'm All right. All right. So now the, the third part, like I said, okay, so let me draw you an example, uh, go back to this example. So now I want to basically understand under which mathematical condition my estimated dynamics can construct this uh, invariant density or autocorrelation functions. Okay. So, okay. So in this study, I will focus on uh, ergodic Ito diffusions. Okay, which is which is a process X driven by noise, just additive noise. Okay, so uh, I'll tell you, you'll see the reason why it's just getting a bit harder for deterministic. I don't know how to solve this, and this is getting hard. You'll see the reason. 
it's an open problem. So in this context, right, basically a uh, standard assumption is that B is globally ellipsoid, has some growth condition. This is just to uh, ensure that it has a unique solutions and you, know, you can bound the second moment with this growth, okay? Uh, beyond this assumption, basically we, 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 we indeed assume a, a minorization conditions and there exists some Lyapunov structure so that this guy is indeed not just ergodic, but geometrically ergodic with stationary measure pi. Okay, so this is the this is the uh, setup that we are going to study this. Okay, now what I want to do is the following. Okay, I want to say, well, I only given empirical data from X that is estimated, let's say, using numerical uh, numerical discretizations. Okay, I would like to learn the parameter b and sigmas, okay? So in this case, it's like a study case of the previous case where now the model is completely unknown. We just make it a little bit simpler for the analysis, but even for this, it's quite complicated already, okay? So I would like to learn the B and sigmas, and then let's see, you know, if I learn this dynamic, okay? If I estimate this dynamic, can it actually achieve the invariant statistics? If it does, what, is, what are the mathematical conditions? So that, that's the questions, okay? So basically, let me be a bit more specific. So given discrete sample of SD, so the discrete sample I noted by X and Delta, this is just euler mariyama scheme discretization with like Delta. We would like to learn B and Sigmas. So how do we learn this? In particular, like what is the supervised learning task? This is just a standard framework is the following. You're given a label pair, right? So what is the label pair? So this is just, I'm, I'm just rewriting this is equation of euler maruyama discretization, right? If you realize. So I'm writing like, okay, I want to learn B that map X to Y under subject to noise. That's the uh, supervised learning model, okay? This is the learning model. How do I want to do this? I would like to solve a minimization problem, right? Okay, I call X is random variable X, Y is Y. This is all ergodics like there you know, stationary. So, so I just want to minimize this under that density, uh, under this L2, L2 space uh, weighted by the distributions of the discrete data, okay? Not even the distribution of the underlying dynamics because I don't have access to the data from the underlying dynamics. I only have access to this, okay? Now, basically, you know, this minimization is, you're gonna get that, this is unbiased. Why? Because you take conditional expectation of X, this is gone, right? So this is an unbiased estimator, okay? And then we will use the, resid uh, the residual of this estimate to approximate the, no uh, the, the, the sigmas component. Basically, this is the strategy. So ideally, this is the method one want to do this, but in practice, you're not gonna even go close to do this. You're gonna do something else. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll see. But first of all, maybe one of the bigger question that you have is like, wait a minute, your dynamic X is ergod, geometrically ergodic, now you discretize it. What about this data? What about this pi tilde, right? Are they even ergodic and so on? Indeed, there is a result, okay? So this is just a corollary from Mattingly, Stewart, and Higgin a while ago. So basically this discretization, so long as if the, factor field, which is the B, B here, right? This B is globally ellipsoid. Then uh, this uh, discretization under, under uh, Euler Maruyama is in fact geometrically ergodic. So what does that mean? In particular, you can bound this norm, okay? This distance here between your environment measure and you, you know, your, this, this uh, 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 statistical error of, observable by a V, okay? And then basically they're bounded by exponential function of, 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 of your uh, N, okay? Now, what is this pi? Pi is just the invariant measure of F. So the weak, uh, basically is the weak statistics, okay? And V is the Lyapunov function that we assume to be polynomial growth. So V, and you can bound this subject to this space GL so what is GL? It looks very complicated. It's just basically all kind of observable function F that is bounded by the Lyapunov function, as well as this is horrible, uh, complicated 
uh, expression, but it's basically just locally Lipschitz. Okay, locally, this can be bounded by a number. So it's just locally Lipschitz, that's what it means. Okay, so basically, ideally, what I'm trying to say is like, first of all, okay, this guy is fine, actually. The discretization as, itself is geometrically ergodic. It got, it has an invariant measure. So I am okay to actually take L2 with respect to that guy. Okay, first of all, okay. Now the learning problem. As I say, I would like to learn B and sigmas from that, right? And then what I hope to show is the following, right? Once I learn this, let's just say call it B epsilon and sigma epsilon. I haven't say what is epsilon yet. I would like to, see, you know, then I have an approximate dynamics like this, right? We would like, this is the goal. We would like to bound basically the invariant statistical error. We would like to show this is actually linear function of epsilon, okay? Where now this is actually discretizations of this approximate dynamics. You wanna say like, hey, my approximate dynamics can approximate the true invariant measure too. That's what you want, okay? Now, of course there are questions like, question is like, how do you get B epsilon, sigma epsilon, right? What is epsilon? I didn't define epsilon. <laughs> I just say it's a scale parameter, right? And then the, the most importantly is like, what are the sufficient conditions to achieve this linear dependent rate? So those are the three main questions that we address, okay? So first I'm going to say about B epsilon and sigma epsilon. So let me remind you, ideally you want this, you want to minimize this, but in practice, you don't get to do that. What you get is you're minimizing the empirical risks, right? You just have discrete data. So here I'm just, Instead of taking, you know, very crazy notation like n x delta y n delta, I just I ID sample them for simplicity of the analysis. So in practice, this is what you minimize, okay, empirical risk. And then once you have this minimization, you use the residual look to compute to compute this uh, covariance estimator. That's what you do. Everybody does this, right? Now, basically, here's the uh, one observations. If this uh, density of your data x, right? It's indeed sub exponential distribution, then you can use a matrix inequality to bound the uh, spectral error of your estimator for the noise amplitude. Okay, so basically, in high probability, you can bound it by this t, t, this t can make very small, plus some generalization, this term that usually we call generalization error in machine learning. Okay, so what this says is the following. If your goal ultimately is just to learn sigmas, right? If you minimize the generalization error, you can achieve that goal because this t could be made small when the sampling uh, when the sampling is large. Basically, is that. But if your goal is to learn the dynamics that you the, the, the invariant statistics that you evolve under this b epsilon and sigma epsilon, you will, we will show it's not enough actually to just minimize this generalization error, okay? So our main result is the following. Now, here's the first time I'm going to define what is epsilon. I define epsilon as the spectral error, which is this, this spectral error. I define this as epsilon. Now, beyond the assumption of the SDE and discretized Markov chain and so on, suppose, you know, here's the two key ingredient we needed in order to show our results, is that the coefficients B epsilon Okay, the estimator is globally Lipschitz with Lipschitz constant independent of epsilon. And then B epsilon is a consistent estimator. This is actually very hard to achieve in the following sense. It's like linear growth. Okay, it's not uniform, but linear growth at least. Okay, so a little weaker than uniform. And then under this assumption, you can now show that indeed we get what we want, right? Your approximate dynamical, the statistics of your approximate dynamics, right? Indeed approximate the invariant density of uh, invariant distribution of your underlying dynamics in weak sense, bounded above in subnorm by this following quantity where rho is less than one. So if n is large, effectively, this is one, this is zero. So you're effectively on the order of epsilon. That's what we want. Okay, so basically you can now relate your invariant statistics to the scale parameter epsilon. Epsilon is the error in your training rate in this case, okay? So we use a lot of uh, the tools that we use is results from Rudolph and Schweitzer and so on. 
But here's the important thing is the following, right? As I stress out, right? If you look at this second condition here, if I take, uh, you know, integral with respect to the pi epsilon delta, then basically you get this, right? Right? You basically say, well, wait a minute, if I take this uh, pi, pi epsilon delta, then you say, well, okay, the L2 error or the generalization error is order epsilon square, right? So that's what we get, we get this. But, you know, this condition is stronger than that, right? So, so basically, if you have this L2, it doesn't mean you're point-wise have a, you know, that, that condition, right? It doesn't mean you have this condition. So this is a consistency condition that we require at least with the existing tools to prove such a error bound, okay? Now, another thing that I wanna remark here is the following, right? This, you know, this I already say, this generalization error uh, is a mean to characterize epsilon. It is not sufficient to, to, to achieve consistent invariant statistical estimation. We also have the linear error rate dependence for two-point statistics. So here, the whole theory is a bit different. We use linear response theory by a paper of Hira and Maida. We wrote down the paper. Now, you know, you might actually wonder why, what, what, you know, why you are actually doing this, right? Now, let me give you one example, very simple example. Uh, how is this theory is going to, to, to be useful, okay? So first, right, I want to achieve this epsilon error rate. The first things I want to do is the following, right? I want to check the Lipschitz. I want to check the uh, uh, consistent estimator. Can we achieve this in practice? That's the main questions, right? So I'm going to uh, go over this uh, method. This is a method. This is just a kernel-based method that I used earlier. So the method is just the following. I'll just give you a very brief overview, okay? Given x i y i, you can construct reproducing kernel Hilbert space here as a eigen based on eigen functions or of the integral operator with a kernel that is Hilbert Schmidt with respect to this invariant density. So what is the RKHS? It's just span of these features, okay? It's a subset of L2. By the way, RKHS is a space of functions. It's not class of functions. It's really nice. Everything, if, if the kernel is continuous, everything inside is continuous and so on, okay? Now, you know, if lambda is po strictly positive, then this is isometrically isomorphic to dense subset of L2, which means that any element in L2 can be approximately in any precision you wish by an element in H, okay? Now, what is this estimator? As I said, this is just like a Fourier expansion, right? You take function B in L2, you take Fourier expansion here, right? This is just Fourier coefficients, right? Now, why do we deal? Why do I talk about this in very fancy other kind of way, like RKHS and so on? The reason is the following: in practice, the basis here we don't know, right? It's very simple. If your geometry is circle, then you say, okay, I use Fourier basis. In practice, the data lie like God knows, right? Then you don't have this basis, so you have to approximate these basis functions, okay, from the data. And just to cut the story short, we just use Nistrom interpolation to approximate this, okay? So now regarding to the result before, that's my estimator. Now I can say it's consistent if, if the following fact is true. If your function that you are trying to estimate indeed lie on this RKHS or hypothesis space, as long as if you pick a kernel that is also linear growth bound, then the error can be controlled by the error of this in the RKHS norm. So you see like the error in here is consistent in linear growth, right? So this expression, if you replace this with the epsilon square, or is in fact, is just exactly that, right? Exactly that, okay? So what does that mean for practitioners? Like, look, okay, if you wanna apply uh, machine learning, don't do it black box. You gotta really learn how to specify the hypothesis space right meaning you have to understand the property of the function you want to estimate. If it has linear growth, you make sure your hypothesis space has that property, okay? To achieve this, let's say we want Lipschitz continuity, we can also achieve this, but you know, I, I, let me sh sh cut short on the story, okay? We can achieve Lipschitz, but I, I'm not discussing. But 
Now, what about this epsilon? Why does why do I stress so much? I want to depend on epsilon, right? What is epsilon? The reason is epsilon. You can use generalization error analysis, you know, to 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 basically uh, to basically get uh, basically a rate for the epsilon in terms of uh, here, for instance, right? Remember, uh, the, my method is ideally you want this. Right, you want you want this is my estimator ideally in this finite subspace, but you don't have you. You need to even Monte Carlo that right. This is integral now. You need to Monte Carlo all this right. So basically, you know, you you in the statistical learning like you will induce if you know how to get that PMB directly, you just have approximation error. But you don't actually. Then you induce some estimation error, and then if you do this careful uh, you know uh, analysis, basically. I didn't do this careful analysis. We just pick upon results that are available. You know, for for example, this is from paper of Rosasco and Belkin and so on. And you, you look at all of their assumption carefully, then you can write this error bound. So epsilon is basically scales like this. So what is this M is the truncation order. This is like spectral gap. And then this is the training data and this is the noise. So you can kind of understand, okay, once you satisfy consistent and Lipschitz, you can also understand, you know, how much is this epsilon? What, what is this error rate? You know, what does it take if you want to uh, satisfy a certain, you know, desired accuracy? So we also consider another uh, random neural network in the paper. We, you know, uh, basically the main takeaway point I want to say is that you should prepare learning with a carefully chosen hypothesis space to achieve a consistent estimation as well as an estimator that is Lipschitz continuous, okay? So now all of this, I say this is a very simple form, right? Now there are many open questions. Now you can imagine, for instance, uh, in this case, right? I say my learning model, when I start this, like I say, here's my learning model, right? My learning model is this, right? Where do I get my learning model? I use Euler Mariama. I assume the data comes from Euler Mariama. In reality, do you know that? I bet you don't. The data could come from different discretizations and that you don't know. That means you're gonna create another bias, right? You're gonna have another issue, right? And then the other thing is like the more harder question, this is open totally, is what about deterministics? It's hard to say because deterministics, you perturb the dynamical systems a little bit, right? It could be structural changes, could be you know, invariant measure might not necessarily exist, right? On of the perturbed dynamics, right? If I use the linear response theory to characterize autocorrelation function, it's not even valid, probably. You know, so that's why deterministic dynamics is a little harder to analyze. Okay, so so, so this is this is sort of sort of the paper that we I, I wrote in preparation. We just finished it actually yesterday. So on, so it soon will be appear in archive. Okay, so that's it. I'll, I'm ending my talk now. Sorry for very lengthy talk here. That's okay, John. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, let me see. If not, in the meantime, if you have a question, just ask. I have a question. Sure. In fact, I have several, but let's, let's not be limited to one or two. So thanks, uh, first of all, John. Very, very nice talk, very interesting. Um, so I have uh, a question relating to, to the, the, the memory that you discussed and that you take into account in the, so the first two sections of, uh, of your talk. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's this sort of maximum delay that you, uh, that you wrote down, I think it was in M in, uh, in those slides. Um, so how do you pick that? I think in the numerical example, you said, well, I, I picked 20 times yeah. the delay. Yeah. Uh, but how, how, do you, how do you ensure that, that's, that you've chosen it to be long enough uh, right. without making it overly long because then computation will become yep. difficult? So uh, the easy way, this is, I mean, of course, this is Takan's theory. Nobody know how to pick that in a very a fundamental way, I would say. The way we picked it, we just look at the uh, 
autocorrelations of the process that you're trying to trying to uh, approximate at that particular observable, right? You have the data of X or whatever theta, right? You look at the autocorrelation, how long does it decay? I remember in one of the examples, either burgers, I think, is like, you know, the autocorrelation decay very slow, but then we pick the M to be, okay, we pick it a hundred, you know, steps, and then we also pick it a thousand steps, like, you know, like very, very tiny and so on, right? We checked it empirically. It doesn't make any difference, right? As long as you cover it long enough. So the answer is we empirically choose it to at least cover the autocorrelation time. Okay. So we pick 20 for convenience. Of course, you don't want to pick 200, right? Then your variable will be too large. Well, right. and sometimes it can be necessary, right? Sometimes yeah, yeah, it depends, but you know. Okay, so it's a heuristic, I understand. Yeah. Okay, so and then also relating to memory, uh, so the the, uh, the material that presented on, on convergence of the invariant mm -hmm. statistics at, at the end. So that's that's in the context of ether diffusion. Yes, this is ether diffusion. You know, so on, on, on the slide, it's still obvious. Okay, so well, t t how about the deterministic system? Okay, right. Yeah, that's, that's a challenge. But on the other, there's also on the other side, there's what about systems with memory? System with memory. Right. We if haven't. You, if you say, well, this 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 x variable is a hmm. um, say it's 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 a macroscopic set of degrees of freedom that I try to model. And right. I want to come up with an effective model for that. So if, if that has memory, like in the first bits as you showed, is there anything that can be done there? Uh, I would just say for this, right? I think if it's a Markov uh, process, we can do it, but with a long memory, I don't know. The theory is just difficult. Here's the, the difficulty is the following, right? Let's say you have underlying system. We rely on that. First of all, the underlying system is ergodic, okay? We rely actually geometrically ergodic even strongly. Let's say ergodic. So the thing that is difficult is like, one question is like, if you perturb it a little bit, does the, per meaning the perturbation come from what you learn, right? You learn it and then you have error. So that's like a perturbation, right? Mm -hmm. Whether the perturb dynamic basically possess invariant measure, that's a very hard question. Right. Imagine this, even just ODE, just stupid ODE, 2D, right? You take bifurcation parameter as perturbation, then you're doomed. <laughs> right? One goes to a fixed point, the other goes to whatever. Yeah, right? And it uh, right? So, it's, so, so, so I'm just saying deterministic is, oh, this is not so simple, you know? Th th there are some uh, results, but those are probably, I would say, you know, it's very hard. I mean, at least I don't understand that much like axiom A type of system, you know, like that has SRB measure. Maybe you can do that, but I'm not sure, you know, how, I don't have an expertise to deal with that actually. That's why I'm trying to say, that's why I avoid this deterministic. That's number one, it's really hard already on that, right? And then the, you know, so it's basically, basically this whole idea is the following, right? I'm just, peeling up what people have done in perturbation theory of dynamical systems, right? And then just recast it as a problem of machine learning, right? And then just make a connection. That's all of this, right? So if the methodology is there, I think the similar setting you can just apply it. But I don't know enough tools in deterministic, to be honest. Okay, thanks. All right, <clears throat> somebody else have a question? Just ask if you do. Otherwise, I might have a question on the, on the second point in the slide here. Mm -hmm. uh, this may be a dumb question, but some, sometimes I see that if I couple some machine learning method to, uh, let's say, an, an X equation, what you call X, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it works perfectly, and sometimes I get a bias, but sometimes also just becomes instable. Uh, the whole thing blows up. I was wondering, could you predict this as well with your, your framework? Right? So basically, in, in this case, right, we were basically just saying is the following, right? I mean, if you want to predict a certain functions, right, you want to make sure that basically you know enough the characteristic of the object you want to predict. 
so that you can include it in the hypothesis space, right? So that, you know, when you're searching in the machine learning algorithm, right? You can hit one of this closely, sufficiently closely. Basically, that's what it is. This is yeah. very hard, right? Very, very hard to do because then, then you really need to talk to the physicists to understand some properties of that, right? And then you inscribe it. So for instance, in here, right? I'm, I'm saying here, you know, uh, if I use kernel method, right? How to inscribe it is like, I make sure, let's say the function I want to predict has this type of linear growth. Mm -hmm. I wanna make sure my kernel also have this linear growth, right? I wanna have a kernel like that because at least this is why we like to study reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Mm -hmm. It's that this is another story is that RKHS is very nice. It's the following is like, whatever inside the kernel it will be inherited by all the functions. If the kernel is 10 times differentiable, the function is two. If the kernel looks like this, you know, have the growth, then all of the function will have that property. So you can basically, you know, inscribe it in the kernel. Okay. So this is one, one, one thing why we understood this so well. But for the machine learning, let's just say if you really do this, you know, ReLU, that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. That's very hard. I mean, forget about even the optimization. Optimization is like, I don't think anyone honestly understand that, right? Meaning like, look, you are using local optimization method. You got some parameters. How do you make sure it's actually, you know, adequate, right? But, you know, beyond that question, let's just assume that it's soft, <laughs> right? Just look at the approximation property a second. There are a lot of theory people say like, oh, ReLU with this three deep layer and this length and whatever can be a, it's a universal in whatever yeah. sense, meaning that you can maybe if it's universal in a continuous function, that means you can continuous uh, approximate any continuous function uh, as close as possible. That's the approximation theory. But in practice, you see like you, in practice here, even I split this, right? That is just this piece of error. How about estimation? Estimation error will come also in, in your networks in terms of how you estimate the parameters and so on, right? That will come in here, plus the optimization error. Now the estimation error, that will kill you. Actually, sometimes we say the following, even if your function class is very large, let's just say your function space, hypothesis space, very large, you throw in anything you want. When you really want to estimate the, the object that you're looking for, it's very hard to do, meaning you go in there, right? It's very hard to find the right parameters. Sometimes, you know, like to have like a really high, too, too big of a hypothesis space may not necessarily do you a good job in practice. In theory, yes, right? In practice, wow, that's what we found is, you know, some that's really hard to fit, right? Of course, like, you just imagine, I mean, you know, you look at, uh, okay, Let's say you, you fit polynomials, right? Small space, right? It's easy to fit, like linear regression, right? Your fit will be horrible, <laughs> right? <laughs> but compared to the neural network, the space is like really hard on linear and so on, right? The fit may be good, but very hard to find, right? So, so I'm just giving you an analogy, right? But this analysis doesn't tell you that, right? This analysis is just basically telling you that, you know, if you want to achieve consistent in the invariant statistical properties, then you have to prescribe your hypothesis space such that it at least a consistent estimator and Lipschitz, right? So if you just minimize the this error only, it's not sufficient. You minimize this error only, it just give you a rate. Once those two conditions are already satisfied, that's, that's all what we are learning at least from this study. Okay, thank you very much. Any last questions, perhaps? And if not, uh, I'd like to thank you again. Very nice talk. All right. And uh, I'll see you all in the next session, which is, I think, uh, June 10th. So in a couple of weeks, we'll have somebody from, uh, from Oxford University give a talk. All right. Thank you again for the invitation and listening. Yes. Okay. Have a good weekend. You too.